All right. Welcome back to the Albuquerque Journal Podcasting Network. Today, we have an episode of, I think we're going to call it Writer's Block. I'm not quite sure if we've settled on the branding yet. Um, but it's going to be a podcast dedicated to UNM football and just talking about the new era under Coach Bronco Mendenhall and everything that we've been kind of seeing recently in spring ball. Uh, I'm Sean Ryder, journal staff writer and uh, UNM football beat writer for the Albuquerque Journal. And today I'm joined by journal veteran and journal legend, Rick Wright. Rick, how you doing today? Doing well, Sean. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, I wanted to bring you in because, I mean, obviously you've covered UNM football for far longer than I've been around here, and you have far more context to give about the program. And also, Bronco Mendenhall, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts. What did you remember about practices in terms of covering the team from when he was here from 98 to 2002 and what they were kind of like? Well, it's interesting because in the Rocky Long era, uh, Bronco was Rocky's defensive coordinator for those years. Uh, practices were open for to the media. Period. Spring ball, fall camp, regular season. <laughs> Nothing is every, the way I remember it. I wasn't the beat writer, and I wasn't out here out there every day. But yeah, everything was open. Uh, now uh, the coaching world has changed. My understanding is that that when Rocky Long got to San Diego State, at some point he changed that and closed practices during the season. But uh, in my recollection. Uh, Spring ball has never been closed to the media, whether it's for the whether it's open for half an hour and then closed or just closed period. It's always been completely open uh, to the media. And during the Bob Davey era, it was it was completely open to fans as well. There weren't a whole lot of fans out there, uh, but they were welcome. Uh, so this this is a departure, but uh, you know this this is Bronco Mendenhall trying to make a difference, and and we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and I, I should have uh, aforementioned, should have said this is at the top. You know, uh, practices are a little bit different this year. In the past, uh, when I started covering under uh, Danny Gonzalez, they were always open. Um, to I, I don't remember the public entirely, but I, I do know that they were open spring practice at least to the uh, media entirely. This year, we just get thirty minutes of uh, access to just kind of watch the first thirty minutes of practice. Then we come back for interviews later on. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you've gleaned in terms of the coverage I'm putting out. I hope you've gleaned something. Well, but. I, I have. In fact, your your Wednesday story after the first day, uh, you know, I was complaining a little bit when when the the news came out that that uh, spring ball practices were closed after the first half hour. I was thinking, well, you know, based on what I saw during the Davy era and the Gonzalez era. Not a whole lot happens in the first half hour. It's mostly calisthenics, stretching, uh, maybe some some in individual drills within uh, the positions. But what I seem to have gleaned from your story is a lot more happened than I expected. You were able to talk about who's running first team, second team, and stuff like that, which I don't remember seeing in the first half hour uh, back in the day. Yeah, and it's not what, for the first 30 minutes, and today was... Today was essentially the same as Tuesday, and we're recording on a Thursday. They have practices on Tuesday, Thursday, and then Saturday's practice is entirely closed to the media and the public. Um, it's not so much 11-on-11 11 11 offense and defense, one-on-ones and the like, but today was really you know defense on one field, on the outside practice field, doing kind of defensive pursuit drills, alignment drills, assignment drills, and then the offense kind of running basically routes on air and the like. Um, and... I think I made the note in Wednesday's story, too, about how much can you glean from a first-team offensive line or a first-team and, and all of that. Right. But um, I wanted to dive into some of the questions that I had for UNM football going in, and I covered this in a previous article. Um, one of them just being how would New Mexico work through losing basically their entire offensive line. They lost, uh, I believe, DJ Wingfield to Purdue, J.C. Davis to Illinois, um, C.J. James' is center to UTSA, um, and there's another one that I am unfortunately Torrent Tarian Stafford to expired eligibility. Um, and there's another one that I'm blanking on, unfortunately. But from what I've kind of seen so far, I mean, the starting lineup that starting with quotes around it that I've seen, it's been Baraka Beckett, who's a transfer from Campbell, Wallace Unamba, who's a transfer from Florida, Florida Atlantic, Juwan Singletary via Grambling State, Richard Pierce, another transfer via East Carolina, and then Tavian Ford who played defensive line last year and then played, I think he made 10 starts on the at like right tackle in 2022. Um, I mean, it's it's been very transfer heavy, um, as kind of expected in some ways. Obviously, they don't have pads on. They haven't been going up against the defense much. But um, I was just curious about your thoughts in some ways about kind of the task of having replaced an entire offensive line too deep. 
Yeah, I've always, uh, regarding the offensive line, it's always just how good are they? How how physically good are they? I know there are techniques involved, um, but I, th- I think UNM has had a string of, of good, experienced uh, offensive line coaches who n- know the game and know those techniques, know how to impart that knowledge. But bottom line is, how good are these guys? How strong are they? How athletic are they? Uh, can they move their feet? Uh, and we just don't know that right now, and we really won't know until the lights go on. One thing we do know, and uh, Bronco was very kind of, he was he didn't quite say it on Tuesday when we were t- asking him about it, but today, I mean, he came out and said, you know, hey, Devin's our quarterback uh, right now, and he's the guy we've been working with, and he's the guy that has been getting the kind of, again, in quotes, first team reps and the routes on air sessions that I've been seeing. Um, I mean, behind that, though, a little bit of a surprise, Justin Holiday. Um, has been kind of the second team guy. And then DC Tapscott has kind of been the third string guy. Um, I didn't think it was, I think you would agree. It wouldn't be a surprise that Devin would end up being the guy, but what are your kind of thoughts on how set UNM might be at quarterback and what they might want to add in some ways? Well, yeah, I think they definitely need another, need another quarterback. And you always wonder about Isaiah Chavez, who's still in the program and still not playing uh, after being instrumental in the, in the two games they won and Danny's first uh, a COVID shortened season. Uh, they're going to need somebody else just, just for insurance. Uh, Devin Dampier, I think has a chance to be terrific. I, I really thought uh, Danny Gonzalez should have made him the starter. If not after the Nevada game, when Hopkins struggled so badly, certainly after the Boise state game where, where Dylan was out and, and Devin played well, although he didn't produce a lot of points. Uh, he's a really talented kid. That's obvious. And um, if he's the guy, if, if he's healthy, he can play 60 minutes for, for 12 or 13 games. Um, then great, but that doesn't happen very often in in a game as physical as football. Um, it is a surprise that Justin Holiday uh, that uh, Bronco uh, mentioned him as number two and didn't mention Tab Scott at all. Um, I watched uh, Holiday play in uh, twenty twenty one. Uh, he's he's got he's a good athlete. Uh, I didn't think he was very accurate with the football, but. He didn't have a lot of help. The O line that that year was was porous. Uh, he had a lot of terrible weather at Utah State, <laughs> where the wind shifted. He, wind was in the Lobos' face, and the Lobo offense was first in the first half and shifted. Was in their face <laughs> again in the second half. It was just that kind of year. So um, my rec- my re- recollection of Justin Holiday really is that he's just a really nice guy, and he's he's eager to, eager to root for. And uh, Tavscott, I don't know at all, but. Uh, Anyway, that was interesting, yes. Yeah, and, you know, I think the offensive line in 2022 gave up like 43 sacks, just an absurd number for any quarterback. And, um, you know, yeah, I I mean, from what I've seen, you know, Devin's been Devin. Um, The routes on air session is more catered to passing than Devin taking off and running. Um, Holidays look pretty good, um, but it's also routes on air. You're not going to totally identify what they can be in that full kind of product. And I'll even admit, too, you know, I was in the camp that, you know, why why not stick with Dylan Hopkins in some ways, you know, at least through the, the first half of the year and all that, kind of that Wyoming game as he kind of had a good game and had to struggle another game and had a good game and kind of that seesaw and all that. But by the end, it was clear Devin was the most talented guy and he kind of had to give him the nod there. Um, on some of the reps, though, for uh, the third team that DC has been kind of working with in that sense, we have seen a lot of Eli Sanders and Iowa State running back taking Wildcat snaps. I talked to Eli today uh, for the first time, met him, and just talked about you know him coming here. He, he said you know just kind of a fresh start and all that appealed to him in some ways. Um, as you're well familiar, Rick, uh, UNM has to replace a uh, thousand plus yard rusher in Jacory Krosky Merritt, aka Bill. Um, I, you know, I, you've only seen Andrew. I know. I don't think you've seen Eli or uh, Javen Jacobs. But Correct. I mean, what do you kind of? How do you view this running back room? Well, Andrew Henry averaged uh, better than five yards a carry, I believe. Of course, some of a lot of it was that sixty crazy sixty-two yard run <laughs> against Utah State. But he's a talented guy. Uh, I wasn't blown away when they they signed him because his his stats at uh, was it Louisiana UL, Louisiana Monroe yeah ULM were not great. But uh, he he's talented and and. Uh, for Bronco, uh, based on what I saw on your your YouTube video, uh, he brought up himself how happy he was with that group, with that room. Uh, so that's that's got to be an encouraging thing. 
Yeah, it's not a really deep room. And I remember I talked with uh, the offensive coordinator, Jason Beck, and, you know, he kind of made the point. It's not a super deep room. You would like a couple more quality options, but the options they have right now, they really, really like. It's not hard to see in practice. Um, I mean, you know, again, it's it's on air not to keep belaboring in the point. But, um, I mean, you know, Sanders is plenty athletic. He's not as big as I kind of thought he was, would be. But, I mean, he's, he's plenty athletic to run the Wildcat package and all that. Um, Jacobs is good, and then we've seen Andrew. We've seen what he can do when he's healthy. Um, kind of want to tie that into another point. I mean, are there anybody? Is there anybody on this roster right now outside of those two guys, Jacobs and um, uh, Eli Sanders, that you're kind of looking for to be a high impact transfer in some ways? At this point, no. I have to say no because I haven't seen any of them yet. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been out there yet. And again, uh, what you're seeing is is limited at this point, and will be <laughs> throughout the spring until that. Uh, the the spring game uh much later it was april 20th is it april 20th yeah which is the one open to the The public yes the one that's open to to all of us uh so i have to say at this point no i just i just uh would love to see all of them and see how uh mendenhall and his staff can can bring it all together one thing i was uh very interested to talk to hear you hear you write about the Wildcat. I don't know if Bronco talked about it or not, but uh, one one of the things that struck me from Bronco's introductory news conference uh, when he was uh, after he was hired was that uh, he was asked, "Well, what's what's your offense?" And he said, "It's basically he wants it to be a no-name offense, something that that uh, defensive coordinators can't categorize." And I would love to see a Wildcat being part of that. Uh, you know, the the more diverse. Uh, you can be offensively without confusing your own people, the better off you are. Yeah. And, you know, that was a, a question I posed on day one. And we kind of talked a little bit about it today in a, uh, in a defensive standpoint, too, is that, you know, they've made the point that they haven't, you know, I think they have ideas of what they want to run and they've kind of alluded to that, but they haven't truly picked, hey, we're, we're going to be a 3-4 team defensively and we're going to be this offensively. They've I mean, the word you keep hearing is morphing, morphing the personnel, to, it's morphing the scheme, I should say, to the personnel you have, which is uh, definitely interesting in terms of, you know, spring ball is always when you want to do your install and all that and get that going. But um, that's been really fascinating to see. One name I do have that could be a high impact transfer, the uh, what I've liked to see out of him, what I've what I've liked that I've seen out of him so far is Noah Avenger, he's San Diego State transfer cornerback. Um, I asked Bronco about this today. I mean, you know, they have a lot of reps to replace a cornerback with Dante Martin, expired eligibility. He just had his pro day on Monday. And then Zach Morris, who transferred to San Diego State. Um, Bronco mentioned Avenger. He mentioned, mentioned Pierre Camini, who's a Garden City Community College transfer, which is in Kansas, I believe. And then um, Bryson Taylor and Northwestern transfer Nigel Williams, um, you know, quarterback can get kind of un- overlooked in some ways and I know it's just two days in but I mean for you how do you look at kind of the challenge of replacing guys that both played over 500 snaps in the defense last year and a guy that was as good as Dante Martin could be in a lot of ways well I mean uh, these guys aren't coming in as is uh, wet behind the ears freshmen so you, you figure they, they they have experience they played uh, when they haven't played it's because they were at a, a in a high profile program and didn't get the chance in some cases. So, uh, and again, I mean, uh, same, same for the defenses for the offense. Uh, Mendenhall doesn't want a defense that people can, well, it's this or that or the other, maybe, maybe even, uh, a three, four isn't, or a three, five, or what is it? Uh, he wants offensive coordinators to be guessing just like he wants defensive coordinators to be guessing. But one thing you have to do regardless of, have to have regardless of what your your alignment is is quarterbacks who can cover you know uh, zone man they still have to cover and they still have to tackle so um you know it's it's exciting that they're here it's it's a it's fortunate that they're here and uh bronco and his staff have have a lot of time between now and and the first game to uh get them comfortable and ready i did want to go over quickly UNM's schedule, um, it looks like a bit of a gauntlet in a couple ways. I'll read it off for those at home. They open August 24th against Montana State, which was a top 10 FCS program. Then they travel to Arizona. They get one bye week in between, go to Auburn, play Fresno State at home, 
They go to New Mexico State, get another bye week, and then host Air Force, go to Utah State, go to Colorado State, host Wyoming, go to San Diego State, host Washington State, part of the uh, Mountain West and Pac-2 merger to a degree. Not a merger, but a scheduling agreement. Have one last bye week, their third of the season, and then you go to Hawaii on Thanksgiving weekend. When you look at the schedule, I mean, how hard do you rate it? And how hard, you know, are there any schedules in the past you, that you've seen that you can kind of compare? Well, when you open with an SES, FCS team, be careful what you wish for. Uh, I'll n- never remember 2006. Uh, Paul Krebs had just been hired. As, that was his first uh, football season as athletic director. Uh, they opened against Portland State, and they lost. And even though uh, the Lobos came back and, and went to the New Mexico Bowl in 07, and maybe they didn't 06. I, I can't remember now. I, I, but a lot of people, and I think Rocky said this too, a lot of people traced uh, attendance fall off to that, that Portland State game. People said, well, they can't be any good because they lost to an FCS team. Uh, I remember uh, Rocky saying, the later in the season you can schedule an FCS team, the better off you are. The only problem is that can interfere with, with your conference schedule because with 63 scholarships to give FCS teams really well wear down uh, toward the end of the season. When they're playing each other, it balances out. But when they come in healthy at the first of the year, uh, they're dangerous, and Montana State certainly is that. So it's a, it's, it's a dangerous way to start uh, Broncos' first season. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and... You know, the, you get the bye week after playing Arizona. Obviously, everybody's well familiar at this point, I believe. You know, uh, kind of, you know, a, uh, a reunion of sorts with Danny Gonzalez, who's now a special teams coordinator at Arizona, and then Ja'Cory Krosky Merritt, who is uh, who figures to be their starting running back from what I'm seeing. And, you know, two P5 games is obviously very difficult on the road. But to me, that, you know, you host Air Force, which is not going to be a tough out, which is, sorry, which will be a tough out. Um, you go to Utah State, who I think is going to be pretty good this year. You go to Colorado State, who should be pretty good this year. And then you host Wyoming, and then you're at San Diego State, and then you host Washington State. That, to me, I mean, that's that's a brutal stretch of the schedule in some ways. Yeah, uh, five home games and seven away games is never is never a good thing. And uh, it's just something that uh, Bronco and his staff will have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, one of the kids you wrote about this morning, uh, I, th- I think it was Henry talking about how he, you know, he he really wanted to see a, lo- a winning season before he left. Was, it, was that was that Henry or was that Ellis? That was Henry. Yeah, yeah he, okay. he made the point. You know, you know, in some ways, what brought him back when he entered the portal was you know sixteen out of seventeen times, Matt yeah. Hall's been in a bowl game. It's easy to root for the guys who came back and who never never entered the portal first off, and the guys who entered the portal and then then stepped out and and stayed in the program, you'd like to see them rewarded. Um, But this is going to be a tough tough go, especially especially in in the era of of the portal in NIL. I think one thing, you know, it is really weird in the sense, um, you know, three bye weeks, right? Because you have the two bye weeks built in because of the... um you know, you get you get the two bikes built in usually because of the you have the Hawaii game and usually you fill that with a thirteenth game. Where where do you feel? On, where do you land on this not issue? But do you think UNM should push really hard to add a thirteenth game in any capacity, or kind of play it as Bronco said, where it's just got to be the right opponent at the right time? Yeah, uh, I I agree totally that it it has to be that uh, just to do it to do it just to do it and and add another loss if. If it, if if it's the wrong team at the wrong time, not a good idea. So it, it it's you're better off not doing it. In, to be honest, the uh, three by week by weeks not might not be a bad thing in the first year of a coaching tenure. I don't think it'll be a bad thing either. Too. I mean, you've had all this roster turnover, so you can be deep in some spots, but you're just not going to be deep across the board. And that's not what I'm seeing with this roster right now. You have quality options in some spots, but not quite all the depth you might like and, you know, just getting those extra weeks to kind of, you know, be able to go ahead and just recharge a little bit and rest guys up. Um, I think that could help things too. And I think Bronco's kind of looking at that as well. He said, you know, it's unique. We'll make the best of it. Um, but he also noted that it's a difficult schedule in a lot of respects. Yeah. I'd, I'd lean that way toward not scheduling a 13th game unless it's just an ideal situation. And I'm sure they're looking and, and they should be looking, but err on the side of caution. Yeah. Um, beyond that, um, 
Has there been anything that you have read about or heard about this week that you think should change expectations for the Lobos? Uh, I, I was just struck by that that video, your your video of, of Bronco's interview after after the first practice, just uh, how upbeat he was talking about the running backs, talking about Dampier. Um, I don't, you know, he's certainly not going to say, oh, it was terrible. Nobody's terrible, it, you know, one day, one day in, in, in the spring. Uh, but it was it was uh, it was encouraging to hear him encouraged a little bit, and and he's he's uh, you know he and Rocky Long are two straight shooters in my experience. A lot of experience with Rocky, less so with Bronco, but that's my feeling. He's not he's not gonna he's not into spin. He's gonna tell you honestly what he thinks as much as he can. He's not gonna trash anybody or say like I said, we're terrible. Uh, I remember Rudy Feldman when he came in back way back in uh, in '69, I guess it was. He said we were a terrible football team, and he was right. They went 0-10, uh, but uh, you know it was it was encouraging for me because he, he you know Mendenhall wouldn't say it if he didn't think it. He's he's not going to deliberately raise expectations beyond where they should be. So just the fact that he he was upbeat uh, was a good thing. Yeah, and I, I think that that's the read I've gotten every time I've spoken with them. There is a level of honesty. I, I don't feel like I'm being, you know, kind of not lied to, but, you know, we're pumping this up in this direction and kind of going that way. Um, and he has been clear, clear. I mean, he said it again today. You know, he, he likes his team. He likes what he's seen in terms of the effort and the desire. Then he made the point. Still have a long way to go towards, you know, actually getting ready to play a game and getting that way. But, um, no, I mean, it's, it's clear he's optimistic. And I'm seeing what's – been intriguing to me too is how optimistic some of the other players have been too in terms of not just guys that are coming in for you know getting a fresh start and a new opportunity but some of the guys that went through a pretty laborious process you know the previous coaching staff that brought them in and all that obviously got dismissed and that's a lot to go through but them kind of talking that through and saying you know like hey but we really like what we're seeing here and we're really feel kind of empowered by what we're seeing that's been intriguing as well are there any other thoughts that you have today, Rick, on UNM football you wanted to get out there? Well, you always wonder why why people leave, why they they enter the portal. Like, the, why would the Ericsons and Riley leave now? You know, after one practice, uh, I assume they weren't there today. No. Yeah, uh, you know, just always wonder. Uh, was was it? Uh, did they feel they weren't going to play? I can't believe that's the case in term, in Riley's uh, situation. Uh, did they just didn't, did not like what uh, Mendenhall was doing with the program? You know, what was it? Maybe is, is did they have feelers from someplace else? Uh, they might want to go in this this day and age. You you just wonder. But uh, all Mendenhall can do is move on. Yeah, and we're, I mean, hopefully we're going to get some answers on that, and that hopefully will end up in both the Albuquerque Journal and the print edition and online, but um, they won't be in this podcast, which you can find uh, on YouTube and all platforms, including Spotify and, Sound- and SoundCloud. Rick, I really appreciate you coming on today, man. Oh, thanks for having me. My pleasure.